How information is processed occurs in the exact same way regardless of whether you are in a newborn or an elder. You know, there's no real changes that occur during the lifespan regarding how this works. But there are a few interesting things that occur early on in life that do make it kind of stand out a little bit. And when it comes to understanding those differences, the easiest way to think about it and to talk about it is to use a computer model. So just like a computer, the mind has both hardware and software. That mental hardware refers to those schemes that I was talking about in the previous video. You know, those mental structures we use to organize our thoughts and allow our thoughts to be efficient, uh, used efficiently. The mental software, on the other hand, that refers to what we use these schemes to do, how we uh, like the, the mental programs, like how we operate within these schemes we've developed. So one of the most basic forms of like information processing that you can see even in the youngest of individuals is the ability to pay attention to important stimuli. Attention can be defined as those processes that determine which information should be processed further. And the way you can see this in a newborn is to look for something called an orienting response. So changes in heart rate and brain wave activity due to the introduction of a new or important stimulus. So in other words, if you want to see if a, if a newborn is interested in something, just you know measure their brain wave activity, measure their heart rate. And if it spikes, then that means whatever it is you've exposed them to is interesting and they're paying attention now. But over time, as you repeatedly present that stimulus, eventually they're going to get bored. You know, they're not going to be as interested as they used to be due to a process we call habituation or just reduced heart rate and reduced brainwave activity as a result of the stimulus. So that's, that's a normal process. So attention that should be thought of as step one of like cognitive skills. In order to do anything else, you have to first of all pay attention to a stimulus. The second step then would be to learn from that stimulus you're paying attention to. And there's different kinds of learning, but the simplest form, the most basic form of learning is what we call classical conditioning. This is a form of learning that involves pairing a neutral stimulus and a behavioral response that's originally produced by another stimulus. So this is pretty basic stuff. I'm sure you've heard all about classical conditioning before, but when it comes to infants, it's interesting that they can do this perfectly well for pleasant stimuli. Like they can classically condition things that are good for them and beneficial, but they have less capability of doing it for unpleasant stimuli, things that could potentially be harmful. So the reason why I think that's interesting is because that doesn't really seem to mesh with a lot of evolutionary theories like this doesn't really help the individual's survival if they're not learning from these unpleasant experiences but in case you in case it's been a while since you've studied classical conditioning here's the basic idea of how this works so you have your animal it works the same with any animal humans are no different and you can tell if a stimulus is neutral because the animal will not react so if you, for example, were to ring a bell at this dog and the dog shows no reaction, that's how we know the bell is neutral. <clears throat> On the other hand, if you present a stimulus to an animal and it just naturally reacts, like it just kind of instinctively has a reflex, then we would call that an unconditioned stimulus. And that produces an unconditioned, like, reflex response. So classical conditioning involves the pairing of this neutral stimulus with this unconditioned stimulus in the following manner. Present the neutral stimulus and immediately follow that with the unconditioned stimulus. The dog will react to the unconditioned stimulus, but also it will be aware that the neutral was present first. And you just do this over and over and over and over many times 
after multiple pairings of the two stimuli, you'll notice that the dog will start reacting before the food is even presented. And at that point, we would say the neutral stimulus has changed into a conditioned stimulus and it is producing a conditioned response. So whenever we use the word condition, just you can replace that with the word learn. So the dog has learned that this stimulus means something. And as a result, they have learned a particular behavior, uh, behavioral response to perform. So classical conditioning happens to everyone of all ages. But a higher level form of learning that isn't easy to see in early life. It takes some, the child needs to grow a bit older and develop their cognitive skills a bit better to really benefit from this next form of learning is called operant conditioning. <clears throat> this is based on the research done by B. F. Skinner. It's all about modifying the frequency or intensity of a behavior by applying consequences. So if you are rewarded for a behavior, then you're going to perform that behavior more often. If you're punished for a behavior, you're going to perform that behavior less often. And as I said, this is not as easy to see as classical conditioning when it comes to very young individuals. You can use operant conditioning, it's just not as uh, seemingly effective. Then there's a third form of learning, which newborns do uh, demonstrate very effectively. It's observational learning, or you could simply call it imitation. It's something that is very clearly seen in young individuals, but the, the truth is, just like all the other forms of learning, we do it throughout our entire lifespan. <clears throat> so this is based on the work by Albert Bandura. He, he did a lot of research into what we now call the social learning theory. And the basic idea is, we learn by identifying somebody who is similar to us, we, as somebody that we admire, and then copying much of their behavior. And you're especially likely to copy their behavior if that behavior seems to be rewarded. So step one of cognitive skills was attention. Step two is learning. And then step three is to retain those things that you've learned to create new memories. And young babies typically can't do this very effectively. They can only remember events for a few days or a few weeks. And as they get older, they develop that memory capability much, you know, into a much more nuanced thing. They, they develop a sense of self. They develop what we call an autobiographical memory. So they can retrieve memories of things that happened to them personally, memories of significant events and experiences in their life. But this stuff takes a while. You know, that, that self-awareness, if you remember, that doesn't really start to develop until two years of age. So for the first couple of years of an uh, individual's life, there's really not much going on in the memory department, so to say. In fact, it isn't until about six months of age that the hippocampus, which is fundamentally important to creating memories, and the amygdala as well, it isn't until about six months of age that these things are even developed sufficiently to create long-term memories. So it takes a while for that system to come online. And then it isn't until like the second year of life that the frontal cortex, which is required for retrieving memories, it isn't until the second year of life that that comes online. So in a manner of speaking, the memory system isn't really even started fully until around the second year of life. And this is one huge reason why it can be very hard to talk to a young child. Children's memory seems to just have no real structure. As they grow older, as they move into later childhood and teenage years, then it develops more and more structure and they, they have more order to their own memories. But when we talk about preschoolers, like, uh, unfortunately, if you have to ever talk to a preschooler about something that may have happened, you know, that preschooler serving as an eyewitness, you're going to have a hard time. They're just terrible. They're horrible. It's almost like their autobiographical memory is just like 
a big mixture of ideas. That some of these ideas aren't even their own ideas. Like they'll mix in fact and fiction in there. Like they might start talking to you about something that they did yesterday and then suddenly you realize they're talking about the episode of Ninja Turtles they just watched. Like th that didn't happen to them, but they don't seem to understand that difference between what they see and what actually happens. But there are things you can do. If you ever do need to, you know, interview a preschooler about something that may have happened, here's a few things <clears throat> that can improve accuracy. Number one, most important thing, talk to them as soon as you can. Interview them as soon as you can after the event has occurred so that their memories will be as fresh as possible. Uh, second piece of advice from the research is to encourage them to tell the truth, uh, exp make it clear to them that they won't get in trouble uh, you know, if the truth could hurt them in some way, that you won't hold that against them. And also encourage them to admit when they don't know. A lot of preschoolers, if, if you ask them a question, they're going to give you an answer, even if they don't have an answer. They'll just make something up. So just let them know it's okay to not know the answer. If you don't know the answer, just say, I don't know. And then the third piece of advice is to uh, ask them the same question in various forms. So you can try to make sure that the answer they're giving you is accurate. So if you ask them the same question different ways and they give you different answers to those different questions, then you're going to have a problem. You know, clearly, they, they don't know what they're talking about. So ask questions that allow for like alternate explanations. But by far, the most important thing you can do, and this doesn't just apply to preschoolers, it applies to people of all ages. The most important thing you can do based on the research is to not ask leading questions. So don't suggest things that may have happened. Don't imply that things happened in one way or another. Try to leave it as open and ambiguous as possible when you're asking your questions so that they can tell you what they actually think and not what they think you want them to say. So leading questions can cause a lot of problems. You need to be very careful about that. 